Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, I skipped the introductionary presentation today, so I will, I will just talk in front of a no signal screen. Um, <laughs> so I will um, give you a short intro about uh, what we are doing here, because we have quite a lot of new faces here. So that's, uh, that's good to see. Uh, so we have a lot of Leptin uh, collective members uh, usually, and this time uh, they're not the majority. That's very important that we, we gain some further traction. Uh, so the Blockchain Hub Graz uh, exists since uh, 2016. Um, so somewhere in spring I was looking around what is happening in the blockchain space. I was previously stumbling over uh, Ethereum and got hooked because of Ethereum in that space. And uh, then I found somebody in Berlin, which is Shermin Wojimgir. Uh, you might know her from the uh, Wirtschaftsuniversity uh, in, in Vienna. She's uh, heading the Crypto Economics Institute there. And, uh, and she was kind of introducing the blockchain hub uh, network and uh, then Graz and Brussels joined that network and we three kind of moved on on, on, on that kind of agenda and then we had a, um, a blockchain startup contest in uh, 2016 and that's uh, sort of uh, funny from the from the prize money what we gave out because we kind of gave out like in total 15,000 euros and uh, one of the, the winners, they got each 5,000 euros and everybody could choose in what cryptocurrency they wanted to have their, uh, their winning. And uh, the first two, they took Ether and the other three, they took the price in Bitcoin. And, uh, and you must remember that uh, in autumn 2016, Ether was at 10. So even if you're sorry right now for the price development, then it was at 10, uh, so it's still an eightfold uh, compared to the price when we, when we looked at it, at it at that time. And well, we, uh, we had uh, one of the winning companies was Status, and Status was actually doing a successful ICO uh, somewhere in the first half of 2017 and collected 100 million. <coughs> and uh, from us, they got like 5,000 euros. Uh, in autumn uh, previously. So this is kind of a funny story because I think you were unable to do a contest in 2017. So there is just, there, everybody was kind of, okay, I'm doing an ICO and in the very beginning it was super simple to collect money, you just had to have a web page and then it became harder and now it's nearly impossible. Um, so um, for, for us, we had uh, quite, quite some time, so we founded uh, the Lab 10 Collective uh, here from all the people which were interested uh, in the blockchain space. And we're, uh, uh, well, a couple of people are here, as I, as I mentioned, and we're working on a couple of projects. One I'm going to present here today, but uh, the intention for the blockchain hub itself is that uh, we are open to all kind of systems. So meaning that whatever kind of system, whatever kind of product, whatever kind of uh, dApp you uh, would like to present is here a space for presenting it, showing it to others, making it known. Uh, we usually uh, take a nice film of it and it is also uploaded to YouTube. If we get the presentations, uh, then uh, those presentations are put on SlideShare. The videos uh, you can kind of revisit on YouTube channel for Blockchain Hub Graz. The same for SlideShare. So uh, without any further kind of introduction from my side, I would like to warmly welcome Simir. Uh, he is going to present uh, Elastos. Uh, and let me see. So, the stage is yours. Please introduce yourself you. because otherwise I might miss a couple of points. So, my name is Semi Ramovic. Uh, I'm born in Munich. I grew up in Bosnia, Sarajevo. I moved here to get my bachelor's degree in computer science at the TU. And right now I'm trying to get my master's degree. So, last year I got into crypto into summer. 
I started just researching about it as I learned more and more. I came across Elastos earlier this year. First, uh, in the beginning as an observer, then I joined as a developer, and basically that's why I'm here today, to promote the Elastos ecosystem. And yeah, I must say I really enjoyed the time I spent learning about the vision, about the blockchain technology, uh, of the whole blockchain space in general, but especially Elastos. So, Elastos, a safe and decentralized web. First off, I want to show you a video clip, an introduction. So, we saw the video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will try to break down what happened in the video, basically. I'm going to start off what's wrong with the internet today, so the problem. Um, the first one is disproportional wealth distribution. This is due to the structure of how the internet is, basically, which means a couple of companies, usually multinational companies, have increased power and knowledge, which... Uh, which can they, they, they can then abuse, they are prone to corruption, censorship, and other problems. The second one is the lack of security. Basically, devices, operating systems, the internet is becoming more uh, insecure with each passing day. So, leaving the data and identity of the users exposed to hackers, malware, spyware, and other problems. Um, and this makes things like Internet, internet of Things uh, impossible. The last thing is, there is no real protection of digital assets. Right now, content creators like musicians, writers, um, artists, don't really have a way to own, protect, and sell their work in a meaningful way. So right now, the most dominant business model is advertising. But because the intermediates actually own the value chain, the content creators are actually chronically underpaid. So, what do I, what do we propose? What does Elastos proposes? So, Elastos, per definition, is a safe and reliable internet of the future. It is built by utilizing the blockchain technology, and it is the first completely safe environment on the web where, web, uh, where decentralized applications are detached from the internet while also permitting full scalability up to billions of users. Elastos uh, enables a generation of wealth through data ownership and exchange. So that was quite a mouthful. I'll try to break it down now. So uh, there are four pillars, building blocks of Elastos. The first one is the blockchain, which acts like the trust of the whole ecosystem. The second one is the Elastos carrier. This is used as a communication medium. The third one is the Elastos runtime. This is the safe environment on the web. The last one are the Elastos services. These are the functionalities Elastos provides out of the box to speed up the development of the apps. So let's start off with the blockchain. Our consensus is called the Elephant Consensus. It, it got its name by our first uh, anniversary that we had in Thailand, and Thailand is uh, recognized by elephants. What's interesting is that we have actually two consensus algorithms running at the same time, proof of work and delegated proof of stake. So I assume a bit of basic knowledge, because I wouldn't have time to explain everything. But the first one is merge mining, also called auxiliary proof of work. It's basically one, when one blockchain accepts the work done on another blockchain as their own. In our case, we are merge mined with the Bitcoin network, which means the, the work that the miners do on the Bitcoin network will be accepted on our own chain. So we don't have, have actually to do the work ourselves. So this has benefits. Um, like energy efficiency, it is very environmentally friendly since we're actually not producing, uh, computing the hash again, but recycling, let's say, the, the, the work done by Bitcoin. The second benefit is the network becomes really secure as we use the huge hashing power that is already available by the Bitcoin network. 
Now, the second consensus algorithm is called the delegated proof of stake. Uh, basically, the nodes are called arbitra arbitrators and they sign off or verify the blocks that come um, on the Elastos blockchain. This is a very, there's a, a strong benefit to this. It's called finality, which means, uh, let's say there's a 51 attack on Bitcoin or, or on the proof of work side of the consensus. They won't really be able to do anything because the proof of stake nodes will have to sign those, let's say, malicious blocks and they won't do it. And if the proof of stake nodes collude and want to attack the network, they can't really do anything t since they only sign off the nodes, verify the nodes. They don't really produce blocks. So if one wanted to attack Elastos, they would have to have the majority of the miners and the majority of the nodes. TPOS is also very interesting because it allows token transfers between the main chain and side chains. I will be getting into it the next slide. So Elastos is the first blockchain that strives actually to solve, uh, strives to be the first blockchain who's, uh, who will solve the trilemma of security, decentralization, and scalability. As we know today, like uh, networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, it can be said that they are secure and decentralized, but it cannot be said they're scalable. For the same, uh, or NEO or EOS, they may be scalable to some degree, but they're not really decentralized. So we hope to solve all three of them. So this is how the main chain and side chain structure of Elastos looks like. Down here, we have the Bitcoin network, and basically the Elastos blockchain gets merged mined from the Bitcoin network. Now on the Elastos network, there could be more side chains connected to it. For example, here's one side chain, and one, here's one uh, service that's based on the, on the side chain. So this is basically some kind of application, a dApp basically. Here's another one, and there are also uh, Elastos services, system, system uh, side chains. Basically, like stuff like decentralized IDs, decentralized storage, functionality that will help developers like speed up the development. So Ethereum has, I guess, two big problems. The first one is the lack of computation power and the flexibility. And the second one is it is not really designed to store data, even though it is being used like that. So at Elastos, the main chain actually handles only the basic transactions and the payments. So it reduces pressure on the main chain. And the dApps, actually the smart contracts run on the side chain. So every dApp that wishes to run smart contracts can have, it, have its own side chain. This obviously will, uh, we will avoid problems with like congestion or high fees like it happens on other, other networks. So the interesting thing is that side chains are completely customizable. They can choose to get merge mined with Elastos and in turn with Bitcoin. So get the free benefits of security and you don't really have to uh, care for security since it's given. <clears throat> but you can also use your own custom algorithm, consensus, consensus algorithm if you like so. Another interesting thing is that we all provide Ethereum and NEO smart contracts. So if you already have a bunch of code written or, or you don't know how to program for Ethereum, it will be really easy to uh, change to Elastos. You can just make a side chain that's compatible to Ethereum or NEO and basically that's it. And now, the key difference, basically this part, the first part solves the first problem, problem the lack of computation flexibility, and the second problem is solved uh, because the dApps actually run on the Elastos runtime. And the Elastos runtime is a safe environment of Elastos ecosystem. So what's the runtime? It's basically a C++ virtual machine that runs on top of existing operating systems like Android, iOS, Linux, Windows. It can be thought as an operating system inside an operating system. So 
since it's a C++ virtual machine, it can run on any device, basically. So <clears throat> let's see a virus got in, in the D app. Since, a, since it's a virtual machine, you can simply shut down the application, the virus will get sh deleted, uh, and it won't really be able to escape the sandbox environment. The second thing, the, uh, the benefit of runtime is that the runtime actually disables the TCP IP protocol and the HTTP, HTTPS for the decentralized applications. What this means that, uh, is that applications don't actually have direct access to the internet. Uh, they in turn will communicate Uh, yep, that job will be delegated, the communication with the internet will be delegated to the runtime, and the runtime communicates through the Elastos carrier. So, uh, the Elastos carrier. So what is a peer-to-peer -peer network? Really simply, a peer-to-peer -peer network is when you have two or more computers that are directly connected to each other. So it's not a WhatsApp application that has to go through some central server, it's more like a BitTorrent or Skype, just, so the, the idea is to communicate directly, so. Uh, with Elastos, Elastos carries a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer application that takes over all the traffic, uh, on basically, yeah, o over all the traffic, and uh, conveys information on behalf of the applications. So basically, the virtual machines communicate through the Elastos carrier. Everything's encrypted by standard. There's no need for a handshake or any, there are no real loopholes since it's a closed ecosystem. And this, since it's a closed ecosystem, we can be sure, we can feel at ease when we send data. We won't, uh, data won't, won't get intercepted. There won't be any man in middle attacks. It's basically we can send uh, sensible data that we usually wouldn't send over the internet. So, a quick overview. This is the blockchain, and on top of the, the runtime, basically the D apps. In the middle, there's the carrier, and they communicate through this carrier. It can be messages, it could be for sending data, for video games, or simply transferring value. Uh, okay, so a quick comparison between cell phones, TCP, Elastos carrier. So with cell phones, you can call somebody as long as you know their number. With TCP IP, you can intercept packets as long as you, do, you know their IP address. With carrier, uh, it's not really possible since authentication is required before the connection is made. And you, there's also blacklisting, so you can block uh, IDs. Cell phones. Fake tower attacks are basically many middle attacks where one pretends to be a fake mobile operator, basically listens to your conversations. For TCIP, uh, very similar. It's a man in middle attack. With Elastos Carrier, uh, those things are not really possible since everything's encrypted from the get-go. It's immutable and there's an, uh, it's imitation proof. Uh, what's really interesting about Carrier it's the, the route it takes to send one message from one node to another node, it's not really predictable. So it might take once, uh, it will, in two different, uh, if you send the same message to the same person, two times it, it, it will not take the same route, it can take a different route. So it, this makes many middle attacks extremely hard, as they don't really know where the path, which, which path is taken. And regarding costs of spamming DDoS attacks, this is simply not possible on Elastos since authentication is required. With cell phones, you have to change your phone. With TCP IP, you have to change your domain or your IP address. So it also has the attribute of anti-censorship. Like here, what's the worst part about censorship? Yeah, I don't know. And the second thing is, uh, there's the Great Wall of China, or the Firewall of China. Now there's an interesting story. In summer, we, on our event, one of the community members of Elastos from South Africa connected to a node in China without any problems. It just shows, as long as there is one path that can the, the carrier take, 
basically the messages will be del delivered. So even the firewall that usually censors Google and the other guys cannot really censor Elastos carrier. So the last pillar services, just briefly, uh, these are the things that will help developers uh, provide them with uh, functionality out of the box. These are like decentralized ID, the decentralized storage, or the decentralized marketing framework, which will provide, uh, for example, e-commerce features, uh, an exchange, wallets, profile, loyalty points, ratings, and so on, basically. So with Elastos, it can be also thought of as a network operating system, where the network is actually the computer. Um, in the middle, we see the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is basically the communication, the bus of the computer. Uh, on top, we see the Elastos uh, application running inside the runtimes. On bottom, we see the personal cloud disks. This doesn't have to be just personal. You can just rent out digital space, but this acts, all of these together, act like a one huge hard disk. Uh, on top of, there are smart contracts as services. And on, top, on bottom, we see Elastos blockchain is kind of like a trust zone of this smart web. So I want to say again what the goal of Elastos platform is. So we want to create different business models, so not just advertising. And we could say the Elastos ecosystem basically provides this copyright, copyright protection by design. Since we create this um, encapsulated ecosystem that doesn't, the data never, never, never really leaves the Elastos ecosystem. That makes it really safe. And basically what we're trying to do is we try to empower content creators to give them the power, uh, the capacity to own, to sell their work in any way they see fit. And a concept that helps this is the digital asset scarcity. So let's say you wrote a book and you want to publish the book on Elastos. So you make 10,000 copies, each copy get, gets an ID, so unique ID, decentralized ID. And you sell them basically. When somebody buys it, they really own the book. It's not like on Amazon. On Amazon, you don't really buy a book. You just rent it for a lifetime, since you can't really sell it again. So when you have decentralized IDs, you can sell the book to some other person. So if you made 10,000 copies, the book might be really good, and the price might actually rise due to scarcity. And it just shows the flexibility of this kind of system. And yeah, this is the point I was talking about, a lifetime lease or ownership, there's a difference. So I wanna go quickly over the milestones. We had an alpha smart web release in August 2018. We released all the alpha versions of the runtime, the carrier, the blockchain, most of the things. This month, we are actually releasing the DPoS consensus and the Ethereum and NEOS sidechains. Next month will be a, a new version of Elastos Carrier. Elastos Runtime will be available for iOS. Right now we only have it for Android. In two months, the Elastos Storage Proof of Concept will be released. In Q1, we start, uh, plan to start the Supernode election. So people will be able to stake Elastos. So this is a bit of progress of, progress of the carrier nodes. Right now we build the carrier, basically the nodes, into IoT devices like TV setup boxes or smart speakers with uh, partner companies, then they sell it. Right now we have 400,000 uh, live operational carrier nodes and basically in the near future we plan to have one million probably next month or so. So the last part actually worked for the Cyber Republic. So what the Cyber Republic is actually, it's an autonomous network of entrepreneurs and developers who are actually functioning independently of Elastos vision. So it's vision to self-assemble and reimagine the concept of a community. Its goal is to promote synergistic partnerships, promote project development, 
and expanded the reach and breadth of the Elasto system. Its identity is boundless and undefined. So what does this mean? We have a couple of initiatives in the Cyber Republic. The first one is called the CR100, where we, actually on our website, we, go, we have 100 projects, templates, examples, that show the diversity and ability of Elastos. And for some particularly promising teams, projects, we actually want to fund them. It is possible to get up to $100,000. So anybody can actually apply. The second thing is circles. Basically, a circle is a way to organize people around certain topics. So there are circles like for DApp analysts, for writers, for marketing support, and so on, for front-end, back-end, basically for everybody. So everybody is welcome to the cyber public. It's not just our developers, it's everybody. So circles, each circle has tasks, and there's a person who's full-time managing those tasks. You can get, you get paid for completing tasks. We have a lot of capital since 50% of the total supply is allocated to the Cyber Republic and 35% of the proof of stake rewards go to the Cyber Republic. So yeah, call to action. Go join Cyber Republic and let's build a safe and fair internet together. It already started, so basically as long as there are projects that, are, that look worthy, promising, we can, you can get funding immediately, basically. It will go through the pipeline, we will check the project, the idea, the white paper, but it already started, basically. Okay, so it's already one project funded? No, right now there are no really projects funded through the Cyber Republic, as we didn't, didn't really get any super good projects that we will actually uh, want to fund, but as long as one comes, we will fund it. Yeah. Um, but if you if you check the, the use cases online, uh, on some use cases, um, there are already some names in it. So it seems like some projects already working on some use cases. Yeah, basically some people applied, some people are working on it. As far as I know, nobody's really accepted for the funding. But a lot of teams are actually working on it. There are a lot of teams already. If you go in the, in the community and under the teams, you'll see a lot of teams. But as, as far as I know, nobody really received funding right now. Yeah. You said this virtual machine is a C++ virtual machine? Does yeah. It, is it written in C++? It's written. Does it actually take C++ code? No, no, it's written C++. Okay. There's a diff. <laughs> Yeah. There's a usual difference between Java Virtual Machine, as if you're running a Java Virtual Machine, there's a basic vulnerability as the code needs to be translated for, from Java to C++ to execute it on the hardware. So as you're translating from one operating system on the underlying operating system, it's usually a point where attackers, hackers basically hijack it and, yeah, basically do inject viruses and attack it basically. What do you mean? Like, if I have a program written already, yeah. it, let's say in C++ or in whatever programming language, uh, how do I put this into this version? The virtual machine accepts any basic program. doesn't matter if it's Ethereum Solidity or if it's JavaScript, but since we, it's in C++, the actual virtual machine, it's, the developers can write uh, basic uh, tape programs in any kind of language, and that language can be translated in C++ and executed on the hardware. There's really, uh, you don't have to write C++. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have sidechains running, Ethereum, Neo, basically any kind of language can run on our sidechains. And these uh, 
programs running in this virtual machine then com yeah. uh, communicate with the carriers, right? Exactly. What yeah. kind of data format do they use? Uh, you, right now it's just messages, raw, raw data. Okay. Yeah, but I think it will get more expanded if we need it. I'm not, I don't actually know the exact details how it works, but I guess it's just raw data, probably. Yeah, there's an API, yeah. but I have no really no idea how it's done. How, it's, how exactly does it work? Yeah. yeah. Basically, what we do, we provide an SDK, an SDK for, if you're doing a Node.js application, we provide you an NPM pack package, and there are functions that you can call, like send data, and that basically do the job. And the same is available for C++ programs, a library which you can link to? Yeah, there's an SDK for everything, and basically libraries, functions, yeah. For everything. Yeah. So one question regarding security. Yeah. Um, how do the carrier networks actually prevent man in the middle attacks? Because first off, since everything is encrypted, the whole thing, um, it's much safer. And the second thing is, um, since the data route is, is unpredictable, so when I when you send. Uh, Using the normal internet, you send a message to somebody, you know where the message goes, actually. And you can position yourself in the middle, basically. Make a fake, uh, I don't know, Wi-Fi station or something. With a lasso carrier, basically the path is every time different, so you would not know where would you place the, basically. Yeah, if it like, if the outgoing point is my router, and if I place myself like, if I'm the man in the middle, mm -hmm. if I place myself between the victim and the outgoing router, then I'm going to, uh, to be able to sniff the data. You will be, but it's encrypted, completely encrypted. So, if, if you don't have the private yeah, key... It's like, it's like, I mean, like, there's no difference then between HTTPS... There is. With TCP IP, it's actually, the headers are actually in plain text. And you can actually see, it, it needs to be in plain text, so you see where the data is being routed. With Elastos, is completely encrypted. That's the first thing. And since with normal one, there are also most of the mail mail attacks happen. Uh, usually, um, uh, usually during the handshake. So before the handshake or before the connection, HTTPS is made. A lot of the uh, fake certificates, SSL certificates, usually that happens. With Elastos runtime and the carrier, there's no real handshake process. It is encrypted from the get-go, and really there's not that, that middle step that usually happens. And this increases security. Of course, it's not 100%, but it is many times more secure than the traditional internet. Okay, but that way you cannot do broadcast, right? What does that mean? You, you always have to already know who you are sending data to before you yeah. actually can start sending yeah. something. The other person has, the other node has to have you on their friend list. Basically say already they are accepting connection data from you to basically send it. This prevents also those spam attacks, DDoS attacks, and everything else. So it's a permissioned network. Whereas the internet right now is kind of like unpermissioned. You can send, you can ping, you can do everything without permission. And blockchain is really good. It's a really good use case when you have uh, decentralized IDs, you can really create this permissioned environment with peer-to-peer -peer networks. Yeah. Um, how does the routing protocol work for the carrier network? Because I think uh, nodes which have, which, have, uh, which have higher bandwidth are preferred. Like in the internet, if there is a backbone node which has very high bandwidth, mm -hmm. these nodes or the servers are preferred. So I guess there might be a vulnerability that some nodes have very high bandwidth because there are data centers or something like that, and then most of the traffic is routed over these nodes. Well, maybe. Usually, right now, our carry is embedded into IoT devices, so usually not so intensive devices like. TV setup boxes, smart speakers, uh, smart TVs, and 
they have, I guess, similar bandwidth, so that's, I don't think it's really a problem. Maybe later on it will be a problem. But I think as the network gets more thicker, there will be many paths that, that you can take and many such uh, more stronger networks that have more bandwidth and I don't think it will be a problem, honestly. Okay, but couldn't I set up a node myself right now on the Linux server? You can do it right now. Okay. Yeah. And another question. What are the staking requirements for the nodes? 5,000 ELA. Okay. Right, yeah. Uh, is there just one type of node? So one tier nodes or are there several tiers like? No, it's just one node. You stake basically 5,000. You get the right to be an arbitrator to run your hardware. Basically verify all the blocks. Or you can just stake like with other systems with and just get part of the money without doing the... Like, like pooling. Yeah, like NEO, you have some couple of uh, NEO, and then you get gas. You can have like 100 ELA and get less ELA. And are there already any numbers on the return? Uh, we know how many ELA, you can calculate how many ELA will you get. Ah, because of the, the blocks which are generated? Yeah, we know the inflation, we know how many, the percentage, who gets how much, okay. and based on your own how much you own, you can calculate basically how much will you get. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you threw the question. The initial claim is it's scalable to billions of users and yeah. so how many or has there actually been some kind of test or is there something that's actually running on ELA? No. This is month the website if I go to elastos.org is it Served by these carriers, or is it served by some? No, it's, it's classic. It's classic. This software is August was the alpha stage. This month we uh, bring out the depots, and next month, basically, the next month the, the depot staking will start, which means the side chains are actually not really running. We have one side chain. This, this is the decentralized ID that is running. The main chain is running. It's been merged mined with Bitcoin. Uh, right now with Bitmain, who owns 50% of the total hash power of Bitcoin. And, but in the next months we will be bringing out the sidechains and everything, since basically what everything we promised, the tasks, we will be giving it, not missing a single deadline. So in the next months, you will most likely see more development. We're in the experimental stage right now. Yeah, the main chain, sidechains, yeah. For the IoT devices, um, you can see that according to the nodes, I think there are more than 99% of the nodes right now in China. Yeah. Are there any plans to expand the IoT devices to Europe or the US? Yeah. Basically, what we, we partner with other companies, hardware companies, and we embed the carrier. And companies, those use our carrier for their business purposes. So they actually utilize our blockchain uh, carrier to reduce costs, make everything easier, save money. And next week we're starting this, you know, the, our partner company, OEX, is starting the sales of a smart speaker that's supposed to sell in Europe and USA. And so we expect actually, that's why I said we expect one million notes. So now for Christmas time, we expect a lot of notes to be sold. So it's probably gonna be that way. Is yeah. there any uh, advantage for me as a, as a user of this? For example, do I get some rewards or do I even recognize that? If, if you buy one? Sales? If you buy one or what? Yes, of course. For example, let's say I bought our own speaker yeah. and then I connect it to the yeah. internet and it's certainly yeah. not right. So all the time, mm. I, you, uh, also the speaker uses mm. some, some net, network. You don't really get any special rewards, but you basically support the Lasso's network, which makes the network stronger and depending on your what you want it might actually benefit you. Or, or so if I don't use this TV box or speaker or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it uses some of my bandwidth. You can control it. If you don't want it, you can reduce the amount of bandwidth spent and it's basically controllable. Yeah. You can opt in, opt out, how you want. Yep. So the user must explicitly sign up for the Elastos Carry Network. So they, like they don't mm. buy the casualty box, just they, they know what's running on their TV box? 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what, what the process is. I think it's already running, or it asks you in the beginning if you want it or not. Okay. Actually, not sure. It's really cool, and you have a lot, lots of notes online. Yeah. But it's kind of weird because you buy TV boxes like, let's say, Apple TV or so, and in the background there is a service running which you are not aware of. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, companies use this network to provide, for example, the smart TV setup box uses the peer-to-peer -peer network to provide customer service. So when somebody know, doesn't know how to do something, they can just turn on the, cust uh, the screen sharing, remote control, like team viewer, and basically fix the problem. So I guess it's kind of part of their product. So they calculated how much bandwidth do they require, and there are obviously some limits. So it won't be like using 10, 10 megabytes of your, <laughs> like all your, all your bandwidth or something like that. It will be like a tiny bit of data probably. Yeah. Can there be also some liability issues depending on what kind of content my TV suddenly pushes around on the internet? This might not be always legal content. And since it's encrypted, uh, I have no idea what it is. Yeah, so nobody can really prove it what it is, so I don't think it matters. <laughs> <laughs> Someone can put illegal content on the internet, prove that it passed my note, and it's then decrypted on the other side. I mean, it, it, so yeah. you can do it, you can still do it. Buy something that is Elastis enabled as a carrier. Um, you still am I an yeah. ISP? Like an internet service it's, provider? It kind of like it reimagines, that's the idea. Since it's kind of, it's like a smart web, it kind of wants to reimagine the internet. So you don't want to go through this centralized service, you need to go through some other way. So if you don't want to go through a data center, center you want to give the power to the people, so you have to go through the people's devices. Yeah, but if so. you operate, let's say, a torn exit node. Yeah. This can get you into some trouble. Yes. Even though it's perfectly legal, it's it <laughs> is this thing maybe a few times per year that yeah. it is perfectly legal. So. Yeah. It's a new technology, I would say, and the law has yet to catch up. I guess the new law. I don't think it's really a problem, honestly, but. Like such projects will be accepted on, 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 on such a network because they have to accept all the projects, right? Hmm? So, what? What? What the last ones? Yeah. Because you said previously, like, you're accepting all the projects, right? Uh, as in the apps? Yeah, when you're funding the projects. You oh, that's only for funding. That's only for funding. You can run your D app regardless of we want of we want it or not. So they, they it's a public like blockchain. No, review of the, of the projects. no, we don't actually don't. Only for funding. It's like Ethereum, you can run if you want. It's a public blockchain. We can't really do anything against it. Basically, the miners and the node, the arbitrators control the network. Let's say the mural of pirate bay of Oregon. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. How many super nodes do you expect there to be in the beginning? Because 5,000 tokens isn't that less. So. It's around 15,000 right now, $12,000. Now we have 32 nodes, active nodes, and we have, I think, 72 candidate nodes. So they are constantly rotating. And all there are 108 nodes, there won't be less or there won't be more of them. So it's a fixed number. There are, there's only a difference between active nodes and candidate nodes. Okay, and what's the process to apply for a node? You don't really apply, there's a voting process. So everybody that ah, owns okay, yeah. Elastos yeah. votes for it. <laughs> and if you get voted, yeah, depending on your rank, number yeah. of votes, there's a, like a rank list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Now, I've prepared a movie as well, so I will ask a colleague to, to assist me uh, with the movie. You can, you can open the uh, artist.eco webpage, because we're going to play the, the, uh, the movie from there. And I hope the other device is working. 
So, good. So you heard Ethereum is not scalable. So I'm, I'm telling you, uh, no, it's not the case. So uh, I'm talking about artists. Uh, so we put there deliberately sustainable, scalable, and secure there. And now in the second sentence, I can say artists is a fork of Ethereum uh, and is extending Ethereum and is part of Ethereum network, uh, as you would have probably heard uh, previously from, from Simir regarding sidechains. So I will not go into all the details about how the technology looks like. So you anyway, you're a sophisticated crowd. You can ask your questions what you want. Uh, so we'll keep it very kind of basic from, from, from the point of view uh, of blockchains, what they are, what they do. And uh, the most important thing is that blockchains are great. So this is like, this has to be stated. This is kind of a, a known truth to us all. Um, and it should be clear to everybody else out there, but obviously it's not because otherwise we would be even fuller than we are today. So the important part for me is that they're censorship resistant, resilient and secure. So why did I put their, the Mona Lisa there? Because that's a very old painting. It's very highly secure in the Louvre if you go there. And uh, it's very well kept and it's a representation of the history preserving nature of a blockchain. So a blockchain can preserve the past very well. So you would always see that something changed uh, if somebody wants to change the past on a blockchain system. You have difficulties to erase things. You have difficulties to um, to get rid of things, which is uh, very important if you think about the legal consequences in connection with GDPR. So if you are putting there uh, deliberately or not personal data there and you find somebody who wants to have it deleted and you are kind of a central provider of a service, which is called a blockchain, whatever, um, then you are in big trouble because you have to rewrite all your blocks. And that's uh, kind of nasty if you have to do that. And if you're ordered by a judge, then you can decide if you do it or you shut down your blockchain service. So the data structure doesn't give that. So just be aware of it. That's a cool feature. It can be a curse. So you can't really say. It depends very much on what you're doing. So be careful what you do with it and use it wisely. So the other thing is, the unfortunate thing, blockchains are very slow. So all the blockchains are very slow. So if you ever hear a blockchain is doing 100 million, million, whatever kind of numbers out there by the marketeers, uh, they don't know how blockchains work and therefore they tell you kind of nice numbers. So usually there is some sort of truth in it. Uh, you can run in second layer off-chain, side-chain, you can run things. But on the major blockchain itself, just be, let's say, in the range of 200 transactions per second. All the deep uh, delegated proof-of-stake systems, the real number, don't use, it, use the EOS website, the real number is like 200. So it doesn't give you more. Um, so you just need to be aware of it and you need to also take into consideration that you have a block time so you need to wait some time until you get the confirmation so if you def define your application in your application you have to have that in mind that it needs some time to put it into a block let's say global consensus somewhere in the range of two seconds minimum three seconds, maybe, yeah, something like that. So that's, that's the lower range of what you can achieve. Everything else, everybody who claims it's faster has a three node network in his own center running and they know each other very well. So everything else is just taking a little longer and take it into consideration. 
The other thing is if they use proof of work, then they are really inefficient. So, and now the Bitcoin price got, went a little down. So also the hashing power went a little down because it doesn't make sense to run uh, proof of work mining uh, anymore for some of those which don't have the most efficient hardware, which don't have the lowest energy cost. But nevertheless, the higher the price of Bitcoin, the more miners will be, and the more miners there will be, the more energy will be used for proof of work, because it's economically feasible. It will be just done. So all those proof of work chains, they will consume if they're, if they're successful. If you find a proof of work chain which is actually not burning a lot of energy, then they're not successful. Of course, then they don't burn a lot of energy. But if they're successful, they will burn a lot of energy. Um, so proof of stake might be an option. So we don't know yet fully. So a lot of things are happening there. Uh, but at least there you don't use the, the very energy consuming proof of work consensus, which is super simple, super nice, depends on the application. I don't bash proof of work generally, but you just need to be aware of it. And this is all leading to very little adoption. So if we're looking at the current D app space and even Elastos kind of, they had some kind of runway and if, if they're uh, if you're looking not just at losses, you look at NEO, you look at EOS, you look at Ethereum, uh, there is a very, very little adoption for the application. So decentralized applications, for various reasons, actually, they have very, very little ground out there. And one of those, um, one of those problems you have, let's take uh, Ethereum for an example, in Ethereum, you have uh, rather high transaction fees. So you pay like 10 cents minimum currently, like 20 cents, 50 cents was already up at four or five dollars as well. But at that time, Bitcoin was like $30. And uh, so, <laughs> so it's uh, for most business cases, for most dApps, it doesn't make any sense to uh, put an application uh, with regular transaction on that particular blockchain system. So it needs to be cheaper to be feasible for real life applications. Or, of course, it can be gaming or gambling. There it doesn't matter. People anyway work for or try to lose their money. So basically it does not matter if, if the transaction fee is a little higher. So it's like it's gambling, so it doesn't matter. So we came up with an idea uh, basically last year and, uh, and then we came up with the name Artis and then we, are, uh, then we were heading for an ICO. Then we hit in full breaks on, on the ICO uh, before basically everybody was anyway saying no ICOs are dead. Uh, I think if you have had a sneak peek into ICO land, uh, then you're just happy or yeah, that it stopped kind of thing. So it was not a environment which, uh, which you should be exposed to. So it's in my opinion, a lot of uh, scams were out there and, uh, and you tried to use scam tactics to scam everybody else. Uh, uh, on, on, on social media and everything. So basically you were airdropping tokens like hell and then you were claiming there was something worth and then you were employing half Nigeria to uh, spam Facebook and Twitter and, and everything. So you should not do that. Nobody should do that, but everybody did it during the ICO craze. So therefore uh, I would say it's good that it stopped it's good that uh, also we stopped and uh, now we are happy that uh, we still do a blockchain uh, the art is Sigma mainnet basically you are uh, you're in the heart of, of, of getting it uh, born uh, which is efficient fast and secure 
uh, fast in the sense if you compare it to Ethereum, uh, it will have faster block times like five seconds. Um, and efficient, it will use a permission system for the proof of stake. So it is not that uh, you're uh, a block generator uh, free to be in its yeah, well, in delegated proof of stake, it can be hard to become a block producer as well. So a lot of uh, proof of stake systems have that actually. So for all techies, it's an Ethereum sidechain uh, which will be connected via bridge and when Plasma is ready via Plasma, uh, uses proof of authority consensus and a known validator set uh, stakes the coin. Um, the consensus will be exchanged for, uh, for Honey Badger if, if that is of interest for you as well. So that's, that's coming up in the future. So now I would show you the film if it would have any sound. Let's see. If you are a developer and blockchain is your business, you already know that providing, maintaining and using dApps on Ethereum can be quite expensive. On top of that, buying and handling Ether is still too complicated for most users. And even those who do have Ether are unlikely to spend it on dApps right now, for reasons that are all too obvious. Did you know there is a better way? Artis is a multi-purpose plasma chain network that will bridge the gap between dApps and large numbers of active users, while keeping transaction costs affordable so everyone can benefit. Artis also introduces Streams, an on-chain way to exchange value in real time that will change what kind of business models can be run on a blockchain. But first things first, Artis provides users with free, spendable ATS coins. Getting started only requires users to download the Minerva app and create an identity. It's easy to use and build for everyone. Once on board, interacting within the ecosystem is incentivized, which leads to sustainable growth and an active community willing to engage with your exciting projects. Now to get the ball rolling and to support both sides of the ecosystem, Artis sponsors eligible projects with a sizable stack of free ATS in order to get your dApps ready and deployed by the time users start flocking in. And it gets even better. If your code runs on Ethereum, it will run on Artis. Is this for you? Did we pique your interest? Do you have any questions? Excellent. Visit artist.eco for more information and to get in touch with our team. Good. So, I would like to thank Dario for the extensive work on that video because it, you can't imagine how many hours uh, he basically put into this one. Let's give him a short round of applause. Please. As you can see, I did not change to the new one. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, Artis, born on November 14th, 2018. So it's a rather new one. Uh, the first trust note, Didi, is it already online? Not on Sigma. Uh, not on Sigma. Okay, well, it, it will be done till today. <laughs> so, bootstrap phase is uh, November 13th. Uh, so basically what we said uh, that we have a one year time frame where we have uh, the ramping up of the nodes, where we have uh, the signing of uh, the support of DAP uh, programs uh, using artists uh, as, as uh, just said in the video. So uh, to give you a couple more numbers, there is a pre-mine of 300 million uh, ATS. Uh, and 10% of those ATIs will go to those projects. So basically 10% of the uh, total pre-mine will be distributed uh, to uh, the app developers. Um, so what else to say? So uh, you can see the naming. So we, we went for a naming that we uh, can kind of make it recognizable. So currently we started Sigma 1, which tells you there might be more than one mainnet. So uh, because it's a sidechain of Ethereum, uh, 
it can be more than one side chain. So this is also answering the scalability uh, question because basically uh, when one chain is becoming full, uh, you can use another chain uh, for doing the same. So you can also think of, because the code is running as on Ethereum, you can even imagine dApps which are using all networks. So basically we are using the same address format because uh, that helps a lot when you do your programming. You can use the same address format on different chains by just connecting to different chains uh, from your application. So if you're doing something which is more important on Ethereum and in the same application do something on Artis and maybe do something on another chain which is Ethereum compatible, you can imagine much more kind of complex use cases uh, specifically tailored uh, for whatever you need. Um, so uh, I wanted to jump in a little bit on the web pages because uh, what you nope holy shit <laughs> so so for all devs among you so you find uh, Lapten Collective on GitHub uh, the latest upload was on pvasm erc77 so that's uh, we extended, uh, well, that's dev talk. So let's, let's skip the dev talk. <laughs> so all the devs, they, they will just like to go through those kind of things. So as you can see, we're, we're, uh, we're definitely putting up the, the source code, uh, open source for everybody to look at, to, to use it. Uh, there is, um, there is, um, important stuff there. I think this one is a very important one. Uh, everybody who is in details uh, will know that. And, uh, and yeah, well, uh, we, we love to hear your feedback on, on this one. If you want to join on, on those projects, just feel free to do so. Um, and we, we try to keep that updated and regular kind of yeah, getting into that kind of process, working with GitHub. So we have a GitLab running in, uh, running internally, and we're we're connecting the GitLab with the GitHub. So basically, all we do is is open source. Uh, what you see here is the uh, the statistics page for Artis uh, Sigma One. Um, so basically, currently there is the boot node and the master of ceremony, and as soon as Didi who was uh, extensively working on, 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 on the first uh, trust node. We call them trust nodes in, in our case. So there you will see the trust nodes uh, coming in within the next uh, days and weeks. Um, so then another one. So the blockchain explorer currently looks like this. So that's a very simple blockchain explorer, um, and we're uh, we're intending to merge or move to to this blockchain explorer, which gives you a lot of more information and uh, and a nice UI uh, for all the things you want to do. That so that's a peek on the on the Tau One uh, test net. So basically. We call all the test nets tau, and we call all the main nets sigma, so that makes it simple to distinguish. And yeah, well, that's basically from the, the sneak peek into the system. And let's go back to the presentation. And it should be some fun in there as well. So we hit an Easter egg for all the ones which like to go on a search hunt uh, within Artis. So as it is a public blockchain, so you could should be able to find what we actually hit in the Genesis block. And the second queue is Nelly Bly. So who knows Le Nelly Bly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> 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 
So I stumbled over Nelly Ploy because I was looking for something very interesting happening on the 14th of November. And Nelly Ploy uh, was going on a trip uh, around the world, like the 80 days around the world, uh, in, on November 14th, very long time ago. So, and because that's such an interesting woman, uh, and nobody knows her, we thought we put an Easter egg about something about her uh, on the Algis blockchain. So, thank you very much. That's a couple of our guys here. And uh, as we know, ATS is back. <laughs> thank you. Oh, questions? What's the, the token use case for the ATS token? Is it similar like Ethereum, paying your network fees? Uh, yeah, additionally, you need to stake if you're a trust node. So a uh, trust node has to stake. And, uh, and of course, transaction fees, yes. What's the incentive to sign up for the app and create an account? Uh, so why should anyone do this? Well, we are, uh, you know, the, the Minerva app is actually, um, is, is a application which is able, makes, uh, allows you to interact with the blockchain system. So basically not just artists, it might be all kind of Ethereum-like systems using all your valuables from different chains. What we actually do there is uh, to establish Minerva as a kind of uh, software on your mobile, which is a gateway to blockchain activities. So that basically a third party application is connecting to Minerva uh, and using Minerva for the assets or for identity. And that's the second part of the application. So the application is handling your identities and it's handling your crypto assets. Uh, and uh, you might sign something with your identity and transfer some crypto assets, or you just use your identity or you just use your crypto asset. But basically the Minerva is in the middle. So we are not kind of trying to create uh, an immediate uh, kind of incentive that you download the app. It's a, um, it's a to be used app for other applications. So that you don't have to put a wallet in your app, for example. So, so, so basically it's about uh, identity, I guess. It's identity, self-sovereign identity on, on, on Minerva. If you have other wallet apps, it's not really necessary to download the app and I think it's the important part might be to, to onboard users who are not already in the blockchain space. Yeah, therefore it's That's specifically different. very different to regular uh, kind of wallets you know in the space. Yeah. So you don't see all those nice numbers uh, and all that kind of specifics about transactions which are so usual in the blockchain space. Uh, so uh, it's, it's very much more uh, designed in a way that regular users can can actually interact with it. So the UI is very different to usual wallets, you know. Yeah. So um, what's actually the deal with the side ch uh, with the side chains? I mean, like in comparison to the main chains, do they have any disadvantages or such? Well, the, yeah, of course, there is some uh, kind of, well, depends who you talk to. It might be a philosophical disadvantage or a real felt disadvantage. So a side chain is usually making a compromise uh, on, on decentralization from the node uh, block generating point of view, because uh, if you would have thousands and thousands of nodes, then you're uh, getting into similar kind of time frames as other blockchains are, so you can't speed it up that much. Um, and, uh, and you're also more confined in, uh, in, in what you can do on those kind of uh, super decentralized kind of networks. So uh, decentralization is lower and, uh, and that one uh, tells, or basically you have a 
theoretical threat that you you risking more on those chains than on a kind of like Bitcoin like Ethereum chain. So security uh, from a from a technical perspective, maybe not from a practical perspective, but from a technical perspective, you could argue they are less secure than than those chains. I'm not sure if you're aware of Loom Network. Yes. They already, uh, I think they're also a side chain on Plasma chain for Ethereum. My question would be how you differentiate from them apart from the Minerva. Ah, okay. Well, the, uh, the Loom network is actually uh, offering a kind of SDK that you can create your own uh, plasma chain uh, connected to Ethereum. Um, and uh, and uh, what you actually have there is a, a UTXO, a Bitcoin-like kind of blockchain uh, and not a smart contract able blockchain. So Artis itself is like Ethereum using the same virtual machine, uh, using parity uh, on the low level uh, and using uh, extensively uh, uh, VASM as smart contract uh, binary uh, for the virtual machine, the second kind of virtual machine you have there on the node. So you can run smart contract code uh, which you can't use on Loom Network because Loom Network is just like non-fungible tokens which you can transfer to Ethereum via Plasma Bridge. In our case we have a or we will use a bridge connection to Ethereum and if you have a regular bridge which is run by the trust node operators you're most, much faster for transferring assets from one chain to the other because you just have to wait as long as it is needed to be sure that the transaction happened on the other chain, which is much faster on artists than on Ethereum. So basically you probably have to wait like, I don't know, six blocks on Ethereum or 10 blocks on Ethereum to be really certain that it is kind of in that main branch. And then you kind of release it on the other chain and then you can transfer the assets uh, on artists. And a plasma connection is always a lot slower. You will have to wait like two days uh, to get your transfer from the plasma chain to the main Ethereum chain. So it's, um, it is a kind of safe kind of way of getting it back to Ethereum, but it's a very slow way. And in our case, we will have a fast way and uh, and, and a smart contract compatibility with everything you do for Ethereum. Okay, and last follow up question. You said your funding projects, which are going to build on artists, how much is the funding approximately? Is it, does it depend on the project or is it equal for every project? No, it will be not equal. So it depends, of course, for, uh, for the project, what, uh, what our intention is to fund up to 100 projects. Uh, and use the 10% of pre-mine, uh, so basically 30 million uh, of coins uh, distributed among those. Okay, and what's approximately the USB equivalent? There is no, because uh, basically that's a blockchain in its infancy. So you would say it's like Bitcoin 2009, so nobody knows how much it, it's worth. Okay, and is there any way to get artists, the token, apart it, from getting funding from you? Uh, if you find someone who has it and give it to you, yes. So, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I wouldn't find one because you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> so what, 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 we are, uh, what we are of course uh, expecting is that at some point it will uh, hit some exchange. Uh, it will be likely to be a DEX uh, in the beginning uh, and it depends very much on the projects. If it's uh, if it's gaining momentum or not, so we're really in this kind of okay. Well, currently, if you find somebody who gives it to you, then he is probably asking something. I don't know how much, uh, but there is no official price right now. I would say it's zero, but you won't get it for zero. <laughs> 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 Depends, you know, if there is no market, you can't tell the price. So it's like Schrödinger's cat. Say again? Schrödinger's cat. Yeah, well, you, if you can open the box. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions?
Any more question? Yes? Um, you said that it's possible to create a second sidechain like um, Sigma 2. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to create a second chain as a private permission blockchain? Or is it always the same? Kind of yeah, we, we, we intended to uh, call them differently. Yes. Uh, but uh, this would not be a Sigma chain. It would be a Pi chain. So we came up with a name for three types of chains. So Pi chain uh, for something like, like uh, permission, private, kind of rather specific. Uh, we thought about something like public interest as an acronym for it. Uh, then Sigma chains, which are public, uh, basically everybody can interact chain and tau for the testnet chains. So there might be more than one because yeah, you might need some kind of specifics on those. And um, nevertheless, uh, we intend to have the basically the same kind of code working on, on all those chains uh, to, to try out the kind of features like, like for example, streams. So we were very vocative about streams uh, when we were talking about uh, artists uh, in preparation for the ICO. Uh, uh, we still consider this a very valuable way of transaction, transacting uh, on a blockchain. So basically, uh, for the ones which don't know it, it is uh, you create a transaction and then, uh, then coins or tokens are flowing from one account to the other seamlessly so basically as a function of time so the it we usually refer to it as a as a water tap so basically you take a water tap and you open the water tap once and then basically the money flows and you look at your wallets and whatever you do let's say you're the receiver then you're getting more all the time so you see how the money is coming in into your uh, into your wallet and uh, and just the other day we were discussing about there might be some funny ideas what you can do with games where you basically let money flow and, and, and find out a nice game mechanic uh, and build on top of that. So this is uh, something which is very specific for, for artists. You won't find that in any other blockchain. Uh, and, uh, and that's something what we put very low level in so that to make it uh, as efficient as possible uh, from the node software, but that's available on testnet just as well as on mainnet. I have another question um, about your identity application. Um, is the onboarding process or the identification of someone in accordance with the uh, money laundering act, uh, directive? and also with the Anti-Money Laundering Act in Austria. So I can use it for, let me say, I can prove my identity with the bank. Well, that's, that's very much up to uh, the identity uh, you're actually using because the application itself, it will just allow you that you create your identity. If that identity is of any kind of kind of uh, reference or usable for, for uh, AML uh, and verified KVSC uh, yeah. depends on what you do after creating it. So you might create it and then you go to your bank and then your bank is KYCing you that particular identity so that you can, uh, can have a digital proof that this identity is KYC and, uh, and, uh, and AML kind of mm. applicable. So uh, yes, it can be used in that way, but that's not application specific. That's really like how it's used with it in connection with the application. Okay. So, you're thirsty, right? So, yeah, let's, let's close the evening. Let's go on chatting. I thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoy enjoyed uh, the time here. Thank you very much for coming and have a nice evening. <laughs>